millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am, but Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. Nerdwallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Oh my God. So during that time I was saving $100,000, you know, one of the biggest takeaways from that is when it comes to saving money, it's not about the amount. It's about building the habit and the consistency to keep doing it so you can see the results. Millennial Money with Shauna Compton Game. It will expand your brain. There always has to be a why. Why do you want to save money? Why do you want to buy a house? Why do you want to change your career? Why do you want to retire early? Whatever the why is for you, it's important. Scratch that. I mean, it's urgent that you know your why. Why? Because your why determines everything, how much you need to save, where you should live, what things matter to you. And your why also keeps you from competing with other people because they have their own why. So you got yours. You don't need to borrow their why. Our guest on this episode, Bola Sukumbi, is a financial expert, author, podcaster, and founder of Clever Girl Finance. And she discovered her why way back in college when she saved $100,000 in three years. That is no small feat. For all of us that are just trying to scrape together our emergency fund, $100,000 in three years is quite an achievement. She did all sorts of things to save money, stuff that you and I might think is crazy, but it worked. And now she wants to show you how you can find your why, create massive change in your life, and just have some fun doing it. I wanted to start out, you know, we all know that we need to save money. I mean, practically, that's what we grow up. (laughs) Save money, save money, save money. But sometimes it seems so incredibly impossible. And you managed to save an impressive $100,000 in three years after college, which I'm super jealous about. So (laughs) tell me a little bit, like, how did you do this? I mean, going back to what you said, it is, it can be very difficult to save. Um, and my experience saving that money, um, was no different. It was very difficult. Um, but you know, one of the first things I did coming out of college was I set the intention. So I got a job, um, in New York City that was paying me about $54,000 a year, um, before taxes, after taxes. <laughs> it was about not 40 so days. much, <laughs> not so much, but you know, to me, it was, it was my first job. I'd never made that much money in my life. I felt like I was a millionaire because I mean, yes. a whole 40K. Um, <laughs> and I just didn't want to waste the money. I didn't want to, you know, I have this big fear of, of ever being broke, which we can get into later, but I just didn't want to waste the money. So I was like, what can I do to just save money and make sure that I'm being a good steward of this opportunity that I have? And so I started learning about money and I started to, um, you know, learn how to budget and learn how to invest and invest in my employer's 401k and invest outside and saving bonuses and tax returns. And then I started a side hustle and was saving money um, from that as well. And I also started automating my finances. And what that taught me was that, you know, a lot of times 
as human beings, we just need to get out of our own way. Because <laughs> when the money is in your bank account, right, if you're manually transferring it to savings or investments, um, once it's in your bank account and it, you have to manually do it, then you're like, oh my God, I wanted to buy that dress. Oh, should I buy it? Should I buy it? Should I go to dinner? Should I not go to dinner? You know, and you start having all these mental conversations with yourself. Whereas if you just automated it, you would just send it right away and not even be able to second guess yourself. And so automation was a key factor to being able to save and just really being lean and mean. I was on a steady ramen noodles and Coke. <laughs> Those were, you know, I was, I was walking through the hallways at work saying, Oh my God, there's a retirement party. Oh, there's a baby shower. I don't know you, but congratulations. I'll take the free lunch. You know, so <laughs> it was crazy things like that. Um, but I managed to do that. Um, it was hard, but, but I did it. I, I love that. I think that uh, that's such great advice. And I love, especially when you talked about setting the intention. And I, I purposely don't want to skip over that because I think that's so important when it comes to money is setting those intentions. And really, whether your word is manifesting or whatever the word is that jives with you, it's just, it's really setting that goal and being super intentional about it. So how did you then say, okay, like, this is my this is my intention. And how did you then, I guess, like really connect to that day in, day out? Mm -hmm. So great question. So my intention was just like, why? I started with my why. Why do I want to do this? Why do I want to save money, right? You don't want to waste the money you're earning. You want to try to save, but why do you even want to do it? And I had to come up with those reasons. Um, number one was recognizing how hard my mother and my father had worked to like just help me get through college and like had sacrificed so much. Uh, number two was, you know, watching my mom console her friends who were getting divorced or her, who had lost spouses who just had nowhere to go, were out of options and had no money and never wanting yeah. to find myself in that situation. And number three was, well, if I wanted to quit this job that I may or may not like, <laughs> I need ding, to have ding, options. Ding. Yeah. And, you know, that was a really a, a valid thing for me at the time because I took night classes in college and just waking up at seven was a nightmare. And I had to wake up at seven or 6.30 and I was like, oh my God, I can only do this for two years. <laughs> <laughs> Naive me. This is not life. Who wakes up at 6.30 in the morning? Oh, my God. Right? Because I would be up to like 4 or 5 a.m. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> after my night classes. <laughs> so that was the other reason. And so once once I identified my why, this is why I want to save, and I had set the intention that I'm going to save, then I started to ask myself, okay, what can I do to actually fulfill this intention? What can I do to make sure that I can click, I can, you know, just check off the boxes next to each why. This is why, this is why, yes, I've done it. Yes, I can do it for this why. And the most obvious thing was, well, you want to save, but you don't know much about money. It's time to learn it. And so I went online, started looking for communities, blogs, um, and I would just read blogs of people. Uh, a lot of them were white men who were, you know, yes, saving money to, to go backpacking and <laughs> <laughs> build a new shed in the backyard and stuff like that. <laughs> but I was like, okay I'm not I'll gonna... use this piece yes. and this piece and throw out the rest yes. exactly so I did that um and then you know at the time I would just go spend time in the bookstore and picking up any finance book that I could I could I could find and I just started learning about money and learning how to budget and learning how to invest and learning how to allocate and do all these different things and I just basically immersed myself I remember as soon as I got to work I would get to work a few minutes early and I'd grab like a free bagel <laughs> <laughs> from somewhere, one of the meeting rooms, conference rooms, somewhere, you know. Is anybody eating this? I don't think so. I'm going to take it. <laughs> <laughs> and I would sit at my desk and I had bookmarked like 10 or so of these websites. I'd I just go to see what they had done because a lot of these people were sharing their personal stories about how they were saving or how they were paying off debt. And every day going to check on those people, like I felt like I was part of their family, their community. And it really, really motivated me to work on the intention that I had set for myself. And obviously, you are an extreme self-starter. You're like a gold star in pushing yourself to hit these goals. But what would you say for people? I, I guess the question maybe is, what do you think gets in the way for most people of not only just like setting that intention, but then taking the action to to actually achieve that? I think a lot of people haven't really gotten clear on why they want the things that they want. And 
I believe that if you don't want something bad enough, you're not going to be compelled to pursue it, especially when you start to get into the weeds and go through the motions and the euphoria has worn off. You're not going to be compelled to want to do it. And a lot of times, a lot of what people deem as their why is based on what, you know, society, their, the world, their family has placed exactly. of them as, has placed on them as what should be your why. You should buy your first house by this age. You should be driving this car by this age. You should be, you know, doing all these things. But are those the things that you truly want? And are those the things that truly, truly make you happy? Because if your why are the things that, you know, you know, make your heart sing, then you're going to go out of your way to get it done. Even when it's difficult, you'll find ways to self-motivate or you'll find ways to kind of keep hanging on to the hope. But when it's something that, yeah, I want to live in a mansion by the time I'm 35 and it's not really something that you want, like, why should you want to save for that? Oh, I'll just buy the dress and I'll save tomorrow, you know? So <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> yeah. So Short term. I, th- I think the biggest issue is really getting clear on why you want what you want and making sure that why is something that truly, truly makes you happy within you. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. And you also mentioned this this fear of growing broke. Does this stem from, I mean, you've talked a lot about your mother's from Nigeria and worked so many different jobs and that really inspired you. Did, does the fear of growing broke stem from that? Yeah. So, you know, growing up, well, I'll start with my mom's story. My mom got married very young. She was 19 and my dad was in his 30s and, um, you know, he was establishing his career and his idea was to have a, you know, a wife who would take care of the kids, manage the household, and he would make the money. And my mom did that, you know, got married at 19, had four kids, you know, and then my parents moved abroad. Um, we moved from Nigeria to Austria where I was born because my dad got a really great opportunity. He worked as a civil servant for the Nigerian government and he had, he got an opportunity, uh, for eight years to work in, in Europe. Wow. So. My mom moves there, you know, and at the time she's like getting into her thirties and then, you know, she's maturing in her marriage with her friendships and she starts to see things happening with her friends who were like her that she just didn't like. Um, friends getting divorced, friends losing spouses, friends being pushed out of their houses with nowhere to go. There are many times where I would sit in the corner of our living room and listen to my mom console a friend on the phone or in person. And the friend would be spending the night in our house because she had nowhere to go. She had no money. She had no options. And that really terrified my mom. Um, my parents are still married today. They've been married for over 40 years now. But she just awesome. Yes. <laughs> but she just never wanted to be in a situation where that happened to her and she just had nothing, right? So in her mid 30s, she decided that I'm gonna go and get a college degree. And she did that. You know, she got a master's degree, she got two master's degrees, and she right just started on. hustling. She started, you know, working full time, working side hustle, side businesses, and she put herself in a position where she could contribute to our our household and she could also put money aside for herself. And so as a child, watching my mom console her friends, you know that was scary for me like oh my god whose house are we going to have to are we going to go have to live in <laughs> you know and then even getting older you know coming out of college um watching my friends and I getting married and having kids and seeing my friends go through divorces and seeing my friends you know move countries you know for relationships that didn't work out and having to come back and start over that just you know there's just that fear that I just don't ever want to be in that position so that's you know a lot of uh of why um I just I do what I do so I don't ever find myself there. That's so powerful. And I would imagine that so many people could relate to that because it's so impactful what you learned, even just unconsciously from your parents about money and how that affects how you think, act, and feel about money today. And most of us don't even spend time to consciously think about that. It, but it's it's inside each one of us. But I'm just curious, is there any downsides, do you think, to having a fear of being broke? Um, there are a few downsides. <laughs> I mean, there's always a downside to everything, right? It's like, you know, there's a downside to everything. And sometimes the fear of being broke can just 
you know, you have to be able to know when to pause and really like take a step back and look at the progress that you've made. You know, for me, just aggressively saving like that, I just went super lean and mean. Um, those three and a half years, I didn't do, I did some fun stuff, but not, you know, nothing close to what my friends were doing. And when I think back, yes, it was amazing to be able to save that money, you know, but you know, I could have, I missed out on, you know, things like, you know, relationship building, things like right. that. So that was a downside, but I don't regret <laughs> absolutely not saving, you know, the money <laughs> because once I got to the other side and I was like, wait a minute, I could do this. Then, you know, I was able to find other like-minded friends and just like build new relationships and things like that. So there's downsides. However, um, you know, downsides are not permanent when it comes to improving your finances. I think with, with anything, that requires you to put in a lot of effort to achieve something or to change something. Um, there are going to be downsides, but on the other side of it, you can kind of rebuild. You can you can definitely rebuild after that. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all in one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30 day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash ETM. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash ETM. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash ETM for your extended 30-day free trial. We've got an Ask Shauna from Becca, and Becca says, okay, this is crazy. It feels like every other day there's a fraud issue with some company or service. I can't even keep them straight anymore. I'm a big believer in credit cards, and since I've been listening to your show, I've accumulated 175000 in credit card points that I'm saving to do a month in Europe next year, which, by the way, I'm so thankful for all your tips because this is literally my dream and it's finally going to happen. Anyway, any tips on how I can keep myself safe? Is there any advice that you have? Becca, this is a great question and a huge congrats. I am so looking forward to hearing about your month in Europe and might I say maybe just a slight bit jealous? <laughs> Honestly, though, we just had a fraud notice yesterday on our main credit card that we use for almost all of our monthly expenses and had to get new cards issued, went through the whole craziness of trying to figure out which charges were fraud, which ones weren't. So no one is immune. And it's happened to me more times than I can count. And even being as careful as you can be, things still happen. So one of the best tips I have is just to sign up for fraud prevention notices from all your credit cards and bank if it's available. We have this on all of our accounts and we get a text or an email when something is really fishy. So I love that they're keeping the eye on the ball and I don't have to look at everything 24-7, but I do always suggest looking at your credit card statements online each month just to make 
sure that all of those charges are yours. And you might be thinking, that's great, Shauna, but I don't have time for my life as is. And I hear you. It's another task, if you will, to add. But I swear it only takes maybe five minutes at the end of the month, but it's so worth it just to verify everything. Also, we pay a monthly fee for myfico.com to get credit monitoring. And I'm going to be honest with you. I have tried all of the credit apps, all of the services, and in my opinion, myfico.com has the most accurate credit score and real-time monitoring that I found. In fact, when we went to buy a car recently, my credit score was quite significantly higher and more accurate on my FICO than on any of the other credit apps. If I'd used the score on the credit apps, I might have freaked out and not bought a car. (laughs) But the myfico.com score was accurate and it was good. So just a little food for thought. If you have another credit app that you love, just stick with it, but make sure you pay attention to these alerts and that they don't just become background noise for you. And I guess if you're all really pissed off, Becca, and you really just want to have some added security, you can always freeze your credit card with a particular company. It's a great idea if you aren't actively using this card just to ensure you won't have any fraud until you want to unfreeze it. It's free to do and you can do it on most credit card sites really easy just with a push of a button. But I would say your best recipe for success is just to take those few extra minutes to set things up so you automatically get the FOD alerts if something happens. And then just double check quickly at the end of the month. Just make sure all of the charges are yours. It's not going to keep you from having fraud on your accounts, but what it's going to do is help you be aware of when something happens like really quickly so you can get on it so there isn't a bigger issue and so you're not out a lot of money, even though if you're with a credit card and there's a fraud issue, there's no problem. If the fraud happens on your ATM card, that becomes another story where they really have to investigate it and sometimes it can take quite a while before you can access your bank account. So... Just be a little careful if you're going to use a debit card for a lot of your transactions, especially when you're traveling. Yeah, I, again, I think that's that's great advice. And 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 you say, I mean, it's it's temporary. Whatever change or adaption you need to make, it's temporary, and you're doing it for a greater. Get greater good. I would imagine at the end of that goal, you were just like so proud of yourself. Yes, it was like, oh my god, I can't believe I did it. And it was it was kind of weird because you know I would check my bank accounts obsessively, and even <laughs> when I got to like fifty and sixty and seventy, like, okay, yeah, that's great, yeah, this is amazing. But once I crossed the hundred, I was like, oh my god. <laughs> Even though it had been building up gradually, 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 there was just something about that six figure mark that just like turned a button off in my brain. I was like, oh my God, I did. I can't believe I did it. <laughs> did you have like a splurge purchase or anything once you hit that mark? Um, Yes. <laughs> I mean, not right away, but you know, once I got over the 100K mark, I had saved well over 100K at this point, And I was, you know, my savings were turning along. And I was like, oh, I've been working so hard. I deserve to buy something. And I really, really wanted to get a nice designer handbag, just something I'd always wanted. And I went out and I bought that. Um, and so I definitely did splurge. Um, I splurge, I took my splurging to a different degree. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> a different level. Yeah. Why <laughs> but then not? but then later on I reined myself back in. <laughs> <laughs> But I definitely did splurge, you know, because I was like, okay, I could take a deep breath now. I've been eating ramen noodles and Coke for three years. Um, It's okay, Bola. (laughs) Yeah, your your blood pressure is like, okay, we need need some variety in the diet here, (laughs) please. (laughs) I love it. Well, I had a chance to sit down this weekend and um, read your new book, Clever Girl Finance. And I love one thing that really popped out at me is... I mean, all the content is just amazing, but there are so many great like inspirational quotes throughout the book that really hit home for me. I'm a big quote girl. And I think (laughs) like reading those quotes, just it's like this little bit of like, yeah, okay, all right. You know, and and then it, it inspires what you're about to read next in the book. But I'd love to hear from you. What are some of the biggest takeaways from your book that you hope readers really like get and let sink in? I think the what's, the biggest takeaway, if I was, you know, talking to someone who's about to pick up the book, 
would be just really the beginning part. It's committing to the process. Um, it is adjusting your mindset. It is getting yourself together to prepare yourself to turn your finances around, whether it's saving or paying off debt, whatever it might be. That's the biggest um, takeaway. It starts with you. It starts with your headspace. It starts with your heart. Because if you're not fully in it, doesn't matter how many savings tips I give you, how many debt payoff strategies I give you. If you're not fully in it, you're not going to make the effort. So it really, really, really starts with you. And that's why I begin the book the way I begin it with, you know, focusing on you as an individual and getting your head in the right space to build wealth, especially knowing that um, it is a long-term thing. And are there any, I don't want to steal too much thunder from the book, but are there any practical exercises or like questions to ask yourself, anything like that where you can really start to think about how you think about money, you know, to maybe somebody who's not, you know, done this before or really thought about these things? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of times people will say they're bad with money or they're not good at money um, just because of how they dealt with their man their money as an adult. But one of the things I like to tell people is, you know, take a step back, get some tea, some coffee, turn on some candles, some music in your house, and really do some soul searching. And think back to how you were raised with money. Did you guys talk about money at home? Was it something that was easy to talk about? Was it something that was always difficult to talk about? What kind of, you know, words were being used in your house around right, money? Was yeah. it like, you know, always being broke or we can't afford it? Like, you know, what are those things? Because a lot of times the way that you are raised with money um, set the tone of how you deal with money as an adult. And so it's really important to understand what all those things are and kind of take some pressure off of yourself. It's not that you are bad with money, right? It's that you are raised a certain way and, you know, which is one part of it. And the second part of it is that there are certain things that you may just not have figured out yet. And once you know how to readjust your 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 process or your mindset from how you were raised, and once you learn the things you need to learn in order to do well with your finances, you will be good with money. You have to learn it. It's like riding, learning how to ride a bike or learning how to swim. You don't just jump into the water all of a sudden and you're like a master swimmer. You have to like <laughs> Learn how to swim, have a couple potential drownings, and then <laughs> <laughs> hopefully survive. Okay. <laughs> Definitely survive. Yes. And then, you know, you figure it out from there and then you become this amazing swimmer, right? Um, and so that's how it is. So, yeah. That's a great way to put it, though. I mean, that's a great way to think about it. it is, it's learning. It's like learning a new language, learning a new skill, and you're not you're not just going to get it overnight. And you're probably going to have a few times you fall off the bike or – Maybe you, you know, swallow, yeah, swallow a little water. I mean, that's just, and I think that's inherent for all of us. I mean, we we all have that. Somehow, I think sometimes people think that people are at certain levels, or maybe they make a certain amount of money that they're immune from these things, and they're not. And I think that's the cool thing about money is we're all just trying to figure this thing out. Yes, yes. Like there's, it's not. There's no perfection in this game. It might look like people are living perfect lives with money stacked up to like you know wherever on the gram, but everybody yes, started the gram. <laughs> the gram. Oh, I have such a love hate relationship with the gram. <laughs> everybody started somewhere. Yeah, Instagram is like one of those things that you know. It's yeah. If it's really like derailing you from your goals, listen. Feel free to block delete, take a mental break away from it. It's okay. <laughs> yes. The, that's our PSA for the day. <laughs> and I know you're, you're, you've built a whole business, a whole career around helping money, helping women. You're very passionate about, about women. Like, what do you think makes money so unique when it comes to women? Why do we do things so differently or what's so different about women? I mean, when it comes to money uh, and women, we are, so, you know, studies show, and this is actual truth, we are better at, you know, budgeting, we're better at investing, we're better at money management once we are empowered with the financial education, once we know how to make the correct decisions, we do really, really well with it. And I really, you know, the reason why I really focus on women and money is because, you know, unfortunately in today's world, despite how it's made to seem we are at a disadvantage when it comes to finances, right? There is that yes. unfortunate gender wage gap, um, which, you know, 
doesn't help us. <laughs> but at the sure same time, you know, as women, we, you know, despite being great investors and great money managers, we give up a lot, right? So a lot of us are, you know, we're graduating colleges at faster paces than our male counterparts. We're starting businesses at faster paces than our male counterparts. But we're, we're even earning more money than our grandmothers and our mothers did, but we're still getting paid less than our peers. Um, we are being told that, you know, when we take maternity leave, it doesn't impact our performance but it's like three months or four months of a year that we're not there to prove ourselves. And even though they say it doesn't affect us, it does. I think there's something, it's, I think it's called the motherhood penalty or something like that. Yes. Um, we take, some of us will take time off of work permanently or temporarily over a few years to raise kids, which means our overall lifetime earnings is being reduced. Um, many of us are single mothers or we are sole household earners or we are breadwinners, right? Um, but then at the same time, we're living longer than men. So we need more money to sustain ourselves. And when you think about, you know, the way just like money is, has transferred down generations and the time that we live in where we're graduating colleges, like I said, we're starting businesses. Um, it's, it's, we're kind of in this position where, where we have opportunity to do amazing, but we don't necessarily have the knowledge because, you know, think back to our grandmothers and our great grandmothers or even our mothers, right? They came from traditional, mostly traditional backgrounds where, you know, in in at that time in the world the man went out as the breadwinner and they were homemakers and even if they did something you know their pr primary focus was on their kids and then their households right whereas sure. we are in the space where like you know female independence you know women's empowerment and we have all these opportunities like we can vote we can drive we can do all these things that they didn't have an opportunity to do which means we can do so much more but we're kind of missing that gap with the knowledge and because we weren't just, you know, money conversations were not things that we had at a dinner table, right? It was things that men talked about at the time. Um, we were not used to having conversations about money. We're not used to comfortably talking about money. We talk about everything else but money. And so that's why it's just really, really so important um, for women to be able to, to, to know more about how to manage their money, how to build wealth, especially given the generation, the day and age that we live in right now. Yeah, it's so funny. Whenever my husband will go and be with his friends or they'll go out to eat, I'll be like, oh, what did you talk about? He's like, I don't know, nothing really. And uh, he'll be like, what did you talk about with your girlfriends? I was like, oh my gosh, we covered this, 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 you know? And it, it's just so interesting that, you know, women were like, we're like open. We like to have these conversations and we'll talk about the most intimate things, but money is like one of those taboo things. It's like, oh, whoa, we're not going to go there. Yep. Yep. And it's, you know, a lot of that can be there's comparison, right? Going back to standards, what you should have, what you shouldn't have. You know, guys are more about bragging and like, I just made this amazing stock investment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, male listeners. We're, yeah, we're not Nothing personal. No, right, nothing personal. Yes. We love you. I'm married to a guy, okay? <laughs> um, but, you know, they'll talk about, they'll, they'll, and they switch topics so seamlessly. They'll talk about cars and sports and women and money and business, and they just talk generally, right? But with us, we'll, t we'll talk about everything else, but I can't tell you how much money my best friend makes. Right. Yeah. You know, we'll talk about hair and sex and babies and diaper changing and like all kinds of things. Um, but we, we'll even talk about starting businesses, but we won't talk about how much we made last year. Yeah. We're going to, we draw this line, this invisible line in the sand. Because I don't want to look bad in front of my point. girlfriends and I don't want right. anybody to think I'm not as fly as my hairstyle makes me look. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. Yes, we are. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so it's, yeah we, yeah, we are great with money if we give ourselves a chance. Yes. Well, I'd love to do a little lightning round of a couple questions to kind I'm of ready. round things off. All right. So the first <laughs> one is... What is the silliest thing you've done to save money other oh. than stealing other people's bagels? <laughs> oh, my God. So during that time, I was saving $100,000. You know, it, one of the biggest takeaways, takeaways from that is when it comes to saving money, it's not about the amount. It's about building the habit and the consistency to keep doing it so you can see the results. And I remember this one time I had a, a dollar that I, I was just spare my budget and I didn't want to spend it. So I was like, I'll try to transfer it in my bank account. And they didn't let me because it was a dollar. I think the minimum at the time to transfer from my, my checking to my like online savings account was like $10. So like, you know what? I'm going to take this dollar. I'm going to drive 20 minutes to the bank and I'm going to deposit it. And I, 
I drove the 20 minutes, probably cost me $20 in gas. <laughs> and I go up to the counter. I'm like, here's my $1. And she's like, you want to deposit okay. $1? I'm like, yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> so that was the silliest thing I did. But it was worth it because it helped me stay on top of my consistency and my habit building. <laughs> yes, victory. Okay, so what is your idea of the perfect weekend? Oh, my God. The perfect weekend um, where my kids who are five are now like 15. They can do their own laundry and iron on the cl- all the clothes and give me a massage <laughs> and make me dinner, tidy up, <laughs> take the trash out. <laughs> all the manual labor In stuff. In about 10 years. <laughs> yes. You've only got 10 they years can, to wait. They can mow the lawn, <laughs> take my car to car wash. <laughs> That's great. That's a perfect weekend. <laughs> okay, what is what is maybe like one thing that no one knows about you? I speak German. Ooh, wow. Okay, give us a little. Um, ich kann ein bisschen Deutsch sprechen. That means I speak a little I'm, German. <laughs> okay, I was like, I have no idea what you're saying, but it sounds really good. That's awesome. I love that. All right, lastly, what is your favorite money trick? If you could to give just one, what would that be? Automate. It just makes your life so much easier. Automate. You don't have to think. You don't have to have m- mental battles. You don't have to like decide to save because it's already saved. Automate. Such a great tip. Well, Bola, this has been so amazing. So many gems. I loved you sharing your story. I think it's going to resonate with so many listeners. I'd love for you to tell everybody where they can go to find you and to grab a copy of your book. Yes, yeah, so the book is available everywhere books are sold as an ebook, audiobook, and physical book. So Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, Target, Walmart, everywhere. Um, and you can find me at clevergirlfinance.com, on Instagram at clevergirlfinance, and on YouTube, and basically all social media. Just search Clever Girl Finance. Thanks so much for checking out this episode and a big thanks to our sponsors that make this show possible. Remember to subscribe in your favorite podcast player so you never miss an episode. But before you leave, I want to empower you to embrace where you are today, the good and the not so good. And remember, nothing lasts forever. Just keep taking small steps every day and remember how awesome you truly are.